reading this morning is the book of Philemon and the gospel according to Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35. We rise as we read God's word. Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Appia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving and prayer. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Paul's plea for Onesimus. Therefore, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, and, but, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And then from Matthew, chapter 18, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. 
But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will, will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is, is the word of our Lord. Praise Shall we pray? Our heavenly Father, this is the day that you've made and we are going to choose to rejoice in it. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. Father God, we just come before you this morning and ask that as we look at your word, you would teach each one of us something of yourself. Father God, come and meet us at our point of need. In Jesus' name, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Philemon is one of these little books or little letters hidden in the New Testament. Um, those of you that have heard me speak here over the past few years you will probably know by now that I have this specialism of choosing one chapter books out of Scripture and speak on them. Um, and there's a reason for that. I get intrigued by them. I want to find out why this person managed to say what they were going to say in 25 verses, 24 verses, or in a very short passage. And that's the situation we've got with Philemon. Now, there are 10 names mentioned in this short book. Five are mentioned at the beginning, and five are mentioned at the end. It's a book about relationships. It's a letter that was written by Paul to an elder of a church, a church that was meeting in his house because buildings like this for Congregations to meet did not exist in the first 200 years of Christianity. People were meeting in homes, they were meeting in houses, they were having fellowship where they lived. They didn't drive across the country to go to church. They drove or walked or went by cart or by donkey to a brother's house to a sister's house to go and have fellowship. And in Philemon's house, there was a group that was meeting in Colossae. Now, Paul had met Philemon very early on. It's Paul who had led Philemon to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Paul who had preached the gospel to him and through Paul's preaching, Philemon became a Christian and he set up camp, as it were, for people to meet in his house. Now, the letter was sent from prison, or actually, more correctly, house arrest in Rome. Because Paul was under house arrest in Rome when he sent this letter, and I think two or three others, including Colossians, to various groups. Now, it's a letter about relationships. 
we have Paul, whom I think most of you know quite a lot about. We've got Philemon, I've just told you a bit about him, but he was more than that. He was a wealth business, a wealthy businessman. He was an owner of slaves, as it was the practice at that time. And one of his slaves was Onesimus. So picture this. This is the ELC. We've got one of the elders or one of the leaders, a wealth businessman. He owns hundreds of slaves. And a bishop comes along, or a respected international speaker comes along, speaks to the church, goes away, gets arrested for being a Christian, gets put in prison. One of the slaves belonging to the elders, to, to the elder, runs away, having stolen a lot of money, not having been very useful, having been a very useless slave, runs away to a big city because that's what people do. When you run away, you don't run away to a small place. You run away to where you think you won't be found. You run away to a big city. And while there, this runaway slave gets in contact with this itinerant um, international speaker. And through this contact, the gospel is preached to the runaway slave, who then becomes a Christian and becomes very useful to the now arrested Apostle Paul. And obviously, if you've led somebody to Christ, they would have shared a whole lot of things about themselves with you. And in that process, Paul finds out a lot of detail about this runaway slave. He belongs to Philemon, whom he had led to Christ many years before. And through sharing, he discovers that the slave had run away and had not only run away but stolen things from his master. And obviously, running away was evidence that he was not really very useful to the master that he should have served as a slave. So here we've got it, key relationships then. We've got Philemon, we've got Onesimus, we've got Paul. Question is, what do we do? What should Paul do with this person who is actually a brother's slave who has now become a Christian, who had run away from this brother, what should Paul do in Rome with Onesimus? And the answer to that question is the letter that we've got here. Paul then decides, I will send him back to his master, not as a slave, but more than a slave. Because between running away and going back, this person has undergone a transformation. He is now a new creation. He has given his life to the Lord Jesus. So the dynamics of the relationships were different. Or were they? Yes, they were different. What had not changed is the legal relationship that Onesimus was still Philemon's slave. There was no change there because that was the law at the time and that hadn't changed. What had changed is that Onesimus was now Philemon's brother in, in, in the Lord because he had become a Christian 
and so he was the slave brother. Here is your slave brother, have him back. These relationships were not easy. And they are relationships that are quite similar to relationships that we have in our fellowships day after day. I mean, we may not have bought slaves as they were in the time of Paul, but we've got employees, we've got people that work for us, we've got people that serve us, And these are difficult relationships that we've got to deal with. Now, looking at the key relationships that we've got here, Paul and Philemon, obviously, have talked about brothers in the Lord, respect each other. Paul had led Philemon to Christ. Philemon was the host of a church where he lived. Paul and Onesimus. Paul had led Onesimus to Christ. Onesimus was being very useful to Paul by serving him while he was under house arrest in Rome. Philemon and Onesimus, his runaway slave, who is now going to be coming back what should Onesimus do with him? If you were Onesimus, you've got this person who is being brought back. He'd run away, having stolen your goods, having taken away a whole lot of things that were yours. He was coming back to you. What would your response be? if you place yourself in the shoes of Onesimus. I have no idea what his shoe size was, but just imagine you could fit in them. What would your response be when this person turns up standing at your door with this letter? Obviously, when he's there, you will not know he's got a letter. You see him there, and then he hands over the letter. You read it. And there you are, confronted by the situation. What would your response be? Now, Paul had to think quite a lot about this before writing the letter, which is why we see what we see in this letter. Because it's, there's language used that is diplomatic, to say the least. He was being very careful with what he was saying to Philemon here. Verses 4 to 7 he's reminding his brother of how good it is to belong to Jesus Christ. what it is that makes a difference between those that are not in Christ and those that are. And that, in fact, this runaway slave was now one of these people that belonged to Christ, and therefore there's a difference in him. That when he'd run away, he wasn't a Christian, he's now become a Christian, there has been a change in his life, he is now different. And that was the plea Paul was making to Onesimus. This person is now different because he has met the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ, we become different. When we have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, we become different. Our lives are changed. And Paul was saying to Philemon, this Onesimus, whose name actually means useful, who was useless to you, is now a different person. 
because he had he's had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus and that encounter has made him a useful person never mind what he has done after that the fact that he is now a Christian that alone has made him a useful person and that's what an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ does for us it turns us into useful people Paul then uses his diplomatic skills. I mean, he's saying there that I know you very well. I led you to the Lord Jesus. I know you respect me. I could stand here and say, do this. But no, I won't do that. I will appeal to you. I will use the word love because that is what we understand as Christians. I'm not going to order you about, I will appeal to the love that you know in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's precisely what Paul does. In verse 8, it says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Because he is now our brother in Jesus. One thing that gets talked about about Paul a lot is what he doesn't do in terms of the relationships here. Because Onesimus is just, was just one slave, but there were millions of slaves. I mean, statistics have it that about two-thirds of the Roman Empire at the time were slaves. Two-thirds of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves. So if you take the one third that were not slave, on average, each one of them had two slaves. Obviously, it wasn't like that. You had some that had hundreds, others that had none. But law of averages says two thirds of that population were slaves. So there were a lot of slaves. So you'd have thought that surely this Apostle Paul, who understands that everyone is free in Christ, should have done a bit more about campaigning for the abolition of slavery. Well, he didn't. And the question that gets asked is, why didn't he? Why exactly didn't Apostle Paul go around banging pulpits and saying, if you have a slave, let them go free, let them go free, abolish slavery and all that. Why didn't he? I'm looking around for answers. None are coming. I'll hazard a guess. Apostle Paul's call was to preach the gospel. It was to take Jesus to individuals and to allow those individuals to become Christians, to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that personal relationship would then make a difference. His energy, his effort, his call was to be a preacher of the gospel, not to be a social campaigner for the abolition of slavery. And that is the approach taken in this letter and all of Paul's dealings. I would tell you what I believe in. I'll tell you what I know. I'll tell you who is going to set you free. I'll tell you who is going to make a difference in your life. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
have an encounter with him, accept him as your personal savior, and once you do that and live your life according to his calling, you will be different. You will treat your slaves differently. If you are a slave, you will behave differently to your masters and the relationships will be different. That is what Paul's job was. To make an individual difference, to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ as individuals, because it's those individual encounters that then make the difference. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, Onesimus, you are a slave. Go back to your master. You are a Christian slave, so you are going to behave to your master as Christians would behave in any relationships. You, Philemon, you are the master. You have a slave. He is your brother. You are going to treat him just like an other brother. In our relationships today, in our work, in our employment, how do we serve our employers? If we're employers, how do we treat our employees? Because a deeper look at this letter would give us an idea of how, as Christians, we should deal with work relationships. Because work relationships are servant-master relationships, not quite slave. Although in some cases you might think probably slave-master relationships, but they are servant-master relationships. As servants, how do we deal with our responsibilities? How should we deal with our responsibilities? And if we've got employees, whether it be one maid, or we a CEO and we run a huge organization with thousands of employees, how do we treat them? And this letter of Port Philemon gives us a glimpse in how we should do that. As a church, what should we do to help people that are in master-servant relationships? How should we help them deal with those relationships if they're confused. As Christians, how do we liberate people that are caught up in situations that they don't understand? And the way we do it is bring the Lord Jesus Christ to them. Obviously, if it's something we can do something about practically, we should do that. But ultimately, we should introduce them to the one who makes a permanent different difference, and that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 3 of Philemon, we read, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 25, we read, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So, grace at the beginning, grace at the end of this letter. And then there's a whole lot of things in between dealing with this difficult issue of dealing with slave, slavery and master-servant relationships. It's all couched in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Freely, freely we have received. Freely, freely we should give. In grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
gave himself for us. We didn't deserve to be set free from the punishment that we rightly deserved, having rebelled against God. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said, I will set you free. I will come and die in your place so that you can go free. There's nothing we can do to earn that gift. It's a free gift. There's absolutely nothing we can do to earn it. We can't work for it. Um, we can work from morning to night, from the day we are born to the day we die. We would never do enough to earn our freedom from our sin. So it's only in grace that the Lord Jesus Christ came, died for us on the cross, set us free. Freely we have received, freely we should give. Having been freed, our relationship should then be built on that, which is we've got the freedom, we will go and live that freedom by giving freedom to those that don't deserve freedom. And hence, the reading of the parable of the ungrateful servant in Matthew 18, 21 to 35. I'm not going to go into it in detail. That's why I wanted it read in full so that we follow. But simply, somebody owes the master a lot. They are forgiven. They are owed a little. They go and beat up the person that owes them a little, having just been forgiven. How stupid is that? And that is how we behave quite a lot of the time. We have been forgiven a lot, but we go around banging drums for very little that people have done for us, against us, comparatively. Having been forgiven an immeasurable amount, we should have it in us to forgive our brothers and sisters the little that they have wronged us, the little that they owe us. We can't do that in our own strength. We can only do that having been strengthened by a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus. Because try as you might, you can't really set somebody free in your own strength because it's not the human thing to do. Human beings, fallen humanity wants to punish. You see it in a whole lot of religions. If somebody does something to you, you go and punish them because that's what sinful human beings do. The only way you can go out and freely and fully forgive your brother, your sister, is to accept freely, fully the forgiveness that has already been given. And when it becomes difficult, the place to look is back to the cross, because that's where freedom begins. When you find it's not in your heart to forgive somebody because they did so much to me, I cannot possibly forgive that, remember that the cross has said it all. Remember that there is nothing that is too much to forgive. Otherwise, we would all be in trouble. We sang, just before I came up to speak, I will never know how much it costs to see my sin up on that cross. And that is absolutely true. And if we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. If we keep calling upon the name of the Lord, he will set us free. Onesimus was sent back to Philemon and he was welcomed as a brother 
as a free slave that was going to serve the Lord in that church. What is it that your brother or sister has done to you that you need to set them free from so that they can serve the Lord in this church or wherever they are freely? Freely, freely we have received. Freely, freely we should give. Amen.